Okay, here we are. This is Quasar Quinology number six. Today we are discussing Fantastic Four Annual number 14. I am your host, Michael, and I'm joined by a very special guest today. Why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Mara. Mara, and you've been on the comic book syndicate before, right? You've joined us for a few movie reviews, Avengers, Endgame, and what else was it? I don't remember. Oh my gosh. There was at least two or Shazam, three. Shazam, I believe. Shazam, yeah. and maybe one other one. Yeah. And hopefully you'll be joining us again in the future. Okay, so um, I kind of just threw you into this. I asked you to read Fantastic Four Annual number 14 because, and the reason is because, as everyone knows, Quasar Chronology covers all of the pre-1989 appearances of Quasar. And because of that, because we're covering everything, sometimes the stories feature uh, Quasar as a co-star, as a star. In this particular story, <laughs> he wasn't quite the star. He wasn't quite the co-star. <laughs> so you showed up and you're like, okay, Mike, I think I read the wrong comic because I cannot find Quasar on this thing. I couldn't find him either. Yeah. So we went, uh, we Googled it, and thanks to the website supermegamonkey.net, we Super found Mega out... Monkey. Yeah. <laughs> we found out that Quasar is in this comic. He's on page... 22 in the, in the digital version if you look at the shot of the avengers flying in to save the day quasar's arm is at the top oh here you can goodness. tell by his quantum bands yes yeah <laughs> so we, we don't, we're, arm. we're not gonna have much to say about quasar <laughs> i admit it so why don't we just talk about this comic in general first of all have you ever read any fantastic four comics before admittedly no um this was a very um, not rude, but very polite awakening okay. to see the style. Um, I'm very more, much more fashion oriented with what I see in comic books. Um, so, yeah, I guess we'll dive into that. I'd like to talk about the fashion. Okay, if okay. That's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, you'd notice a lot of um, the style and the the way people dress in the comic book, uh, as well as the hairstyle, even. Okay. Uh, you'll see the way Agatha's hair is. It's very, very... I believe the comic book is 1979, isn't it? I think I saw it's let, 1979. Let me double check this. Uh, 79, yep, you're right. Yep. So yeah, her hair is pretty much rep representative of those times, I would say. And even um, Sue's hair is the same, and the men's hair, of course. Um, and their their suits, their suits are very vintage, I would say. These, um, you mean the superhero FF superhero costumes here? Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> They're very old school, and yeah, everything is very nostalgic for me. I love I love old school fashion, so that's kind of for me what I see first. Sure. And have yeah. you ever read any comics from this era before? Um. Oh, let me think. Mm. Oh my gosh, I've read the bunch. I don't know if I've read anything from the 70s or 80s now. Okay. I'll have to say no. I think most of the comics I've read are more 90s and forwards. Okay, okay. Yeah. So this is definitely something you're probably not used to then, right? Is reading comics from this era then? Yeah, no. I okay. would say right now... Definitely more. No, no. Okay. Definitely not. Yeah. So this is my favorite era because this is when what comics were like when I was growing up. Now I, for for example, like obviously besides the nostalgia of everything, one of the things I like about these old comics is they have a lot more um, word balloons, a lot more narration. Mm -hmm. The story is really uh, pretty condensed, as you can see even on this page here. Like we're on page ten, and you've got one, two, three, four, five, six panels. There's a lot of a lot of stuff to read. Mm -hmm. Now you could argue that that doesn't necessarily make it better. But in my opinion, at least you get your money's worth. Um, now, obviously, this was an annual, so it's a little bit longer than average. But was the comic, did it take a lot longer to read than you were expecting? Or Oh, no. Um, actually, it was very quick because okay. the kind of comic books I'm used to reading um, now is comic books like Civil War. Okay. Now, I don't know how people, what kind of uh, comic books people like to read nowadays or what kind of comic books comic book connoisseur, connoisseurs like to read, but those books are very long. Sure. Um, so this was very a very quick read for me, actually. Um, and then touching on what you said, the the word bubbles and the, um, the narration, that kind of um, a little bit threw me off guard at first. And then okay. I kind of got used to it and understood um, because I'm more of a visual person. Sure. Um, so I like... Um, understanding things through visual cues, sure. but 
when I understood that it was a shorter comic, I understood why there needed to be the nar- narration. Okay. Um, but yeah, um, I think uh, it was a very well made comic overall. I love the colors. Yes, the um, colors are, are. I mean, now this is angles. obviously. Yeah, the digital version has obviously been fixed up, but it still follows the old style of comic coloring, right? Where it's like solid green, mm-hmm. solid orange, solid red. And there is something to be said for that. Some people might consider it unsubtle or, you know, not nuanced enough, but I love it personally. Mm-hmm. Agreed, agreed. Um, so, yeah, so this is a. I, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of Marv Wolfman and George Perez, but they're most famous for doing um, New Teen Titans in the 80s. So they're pretty well-known mm-hmm. uh, creative team. They also did Crisis on Infinite Earths. So this is early in their, both of their careers. Um, this is not George Perez. He's not quite developed the style that he had later on. But the thing I like about George Perez is he puts a lot of effort into the detail. He, his storytelling is very clear. Um, so what were your impressions just of the art? Of the art? Yes. Um, I think it was, it's still very similar to a lot of modern day okay. art. Um, really? Okay. I think that, you know, the shading and certain, um, uh, how do I explain it? Um, like the line work or? I think cross hatching sure. and the shadow okay. work would be different now. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the colors would be different, but I think if they did color work similar to how we do it now it would look similar sure but even like the angles like even this you know words like sploosh and wham i still see it like to this day yeah and maybe that's just us paying homage to how we used to do it sure in a way but kind of a throwback like batman and like the batman tv show right right yeah exactly but then and then again the fashion right like Mm -hmm comic books now they're going to follow our current fashion so that makes a difference too but yeah like the the perspective and all that is so i still see a lot of similarities in the art okay yeah and i I like that because it means that we're uh we're still paying tribute a little bit to our our roots okay speak okay um now the story i mean the story is an odd one. So the Fantastic Four are in the middle of a battle with uh, the Sandman, the Marvel version of Sandman, not the DC one. Mm-hmm. And then they sort of get called away by Agnetha Harkness, who used to be Franklin Richards, um, I don't want to say babysitter, oh, governess, not babysitter, but, you know, governess. Mm-hmm. Now, Agnetha Harkness, um, around this time, she was a, a major character in the book. She, she isn't anymore. She's not really well known. Um, so they ended up, they end up going to the fictional town of New Salem, Colorado, mm-hmm. and they get suckered into this um, sort of uh, cult, I guess you could call it a cult, called mm-hmm. the uh, Salem, Salem Seven, Salem Seven. <laughs> who, are, who have tricked the Fantastic Four into helping them bring um, their father back to the earthly dimension or whatever. And then it was a Nicholas pan- Scratch. Yeah, Nicholas <laughs> Scratch, right, right, right. Yeah. And so basically the Fantastic Four uh, get um, tricked into being um, sort of, not hypnotized, but sort of uh, yeah. like kind of like frozen. And basically the whole town gets um, hypnotized into being motionless, as you can see here. And then um, Agnetha Harkness ends up using Franklin Richards, who they didn't even consider a threat because he's just a little kid, and they end up basically saving the day. Now, mm-hmm. I know that you're familiar with the Fantastic Four, but are you familiar with the fact that they had a son, Franklin Richards? Did you know any of that stuff? Or uh, Honestly, no. Okay, I, okay. Yeah, this is the first time I've actually um, met Franklin. Okay. Um, okay. So the, this, to me, was more... Um, introduction of franklin than quasar <laughs> okay okay yeah i mean we're only gonna see quasar's wrist in this one but yeah uh, <laughs> so anyway so okay let's talk about the dialogue uh marv wolfman i grew up with marv wolfman i love crisis on infinite earths i don't think he's the greatest writer um what is your opinion of let's talk about the plot first did you enjoy the story overall in this comic yeah i would say so okay. um the story the story's you know the story is the story. Okay, uh, is that uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think it's great. However, I'm also a Quentin Tarantino fan. Okay. So dialogue, 
dialogue to me is important is yeah is king okay um so how how about you i'd like to know what you, you like to know my opinion yeah. yeah okay so I, I would you know we've been covering a lot of stories in this podcast by roger stern mark grunwald i think they're both good writers their dialogue's not spectacular and i have to say the same same thing about mark uh sorry about marv wolfman his dialogue has never been spectacular <laughs> it's kind of the typical stilted wooden 1980s comic book dialogue in some places he's a little bit better because he's kind of imitating stan lee so here in the, the mm, opening page mm-hmm. he's got the thing punching out sandman and he says i gotta pay th- pay back this walking beach for what he did to alicia i think that's kind of funny calling him a walking beach but other than that i think a lot of the banter between the ff kind of comes off as second rate stan lee like want to bet bozo breath you know and we also uh, we've had marshall on our show and marshall hated the things dialogue i personally like yeah it. i just don't think like w- when you read marv wolfman's uh new teen titans run i think that you know the character cyborg yes who's in justice league he tends to write cyborg as kind of a poor man's thing oh. and and so like cyborg is always bantering with uh changeling but their dialogue's never as good as the thing in the human torch by stan lee and so mm-hmm. that's what I feel like when I read Marv Wolfman. It's like Marv Wolfman's FF. It's like, ugh, he's trying to do Stan Lee, but he's not quite as good at it. Um, so it's one of those things where I can read it and I can enjoy it as a 1979 comic, but I don't necessarily think it's great, you know? I see what you're saying. Yeah. 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 So I would read more of this, but I maybe wouldn't be excited to read it. Mm-hmm. Um, now, what about the... As far as the, the whole plot with like, okay, so the FF... They're superheroes, but they kind of have like a science fiction background, you know. They got Mm -hmm. their powers by being exposed to cosmic rays. What do you feel about mixing that science fiction element with, I guess, mysticism, with like basically the witches and all that stuff? Did that bother you? Do you think it was was cool or what? I I think that's all right by me. I like both mixing science and supernatural Okay. in that sense. Um, Yeah, that's, that's all good with me. I think they mesh that well enough. But again, um, the dialogue ties it all in together. And right. if the dialogue was better, I think they would have scored higher in my books. Okay, okay. Yeah. Now, this is um, one of the early appearances of Salem 7. We here, we can see all the different characters here. We've got Vertigo, Bruticus, Hydron, mm-hmm. Thorn, Gazelle, Reptilia. Reptilia. Uh, Yakum, I don't even know what that's supposed to mean. What is your impression of this team here? What do you think of these guys? Um, very old school. Okay. Uh, I love it. I was wondering if they were actually saying their names there. Yeah, are they saying the names? I was wondering. I think they're being introduced. Okay, I think, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, but there was, going back into the the dialogue being poor or could have been better is, there was a panel there, I think two pages down. Um. Like forward? Forward, yes. Okay. When they were kicking the thing's ass. Okay. Uh, yeah. So they were, again, with narrating what they're doing is when they're, like, explaining that who they are. Right. You know what I mean? That, that to me, is an example of bad dialogue. Let's because re- they had to, like, explain who they are while they're doing what they're doing kind of thing. So that, to me, was, in, the, in that context, a bad dialogue a good example of bad dialogue so for example you underestimate us creature or did you forget that gazelle's power is more than just mere animal like agility i am a beast of prey whatever i hunt i kill so yeah ridiculous right no one would actually say that if they were in the middle of a fight um now based on that what would you say is the age group that this story is aimed at ah i see yeah uh hmm. I would say like early teens. Okay, okay. Early teens because there's no blood Mm -hmm. anywhere in this comic. So I would, yeah, I would say early teens. Early teens, okay. Do you think it's something adults can enjoy or is it something they should best leave behind? Uh, It would be something that like us adults should explore Mm -hmm. just to, you know, pay tribute or go back in time. Okay. Um. But yeah, just to if you're looking for something to actually enjoy, enjoy, this is not something okay, I okay. would recommend. Okay. <laughs> okay. So was there? Okay, well, you talked about the dialogue in general. Was there anything particular, any particular moment that you thought was really bad? Not as far as dialogue, but just as far as like. Oh uh, yeah. Anything. 
Yeah, um, when the thing was thinking in bubble thought. Uh, is there a particular part or do you want me to pause? Do you have to check that? I okay. just don't want the, the beeping oh, okay. to be in the thing. Okay, do you want to read yeah, that just, part? Yeah, I'll just put a note. Um, I'll just put a note to, uh, one sec here. 16, ding. Okay, okay. do you want to redo that? Yeah, part? I'll what redo the question. So, so is there a particular moment that you thought was really terrible in this comic? Yes, the part where the thing was thinking when he was lying to Franklin. Okay, do you remember where that was? Um, right after Gazelle tells him <laughs> that she's Gazelle and what he what she was doing to him. Okay. So up, up, up. So this way, forward. Uh, backward. Okay, backward. So right after they were introduced, the uh, oh, seven. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Seven. Okay. Okay. Right. After that. After that. Okay. After that. After that. After still. So after he was being brutalized, okay. that part. Yes. So what page is that? This is digital fifteen. Yeah. So so when he was thinking those thoughts, I thought that was a little bit poor and a little bit cheap. Okay. For so, me, because if I were imagining that in a um, in a movie sense, even you so, don't need to you don't need to have that thought in the movie or have that spoken in the movie i would say because it's obvious that he's getting his, his so ass let, just so everyone knows the first panel of page 15 is what you're talking about to destroy you is nothing to me you hear that thing nothing the thing he ain't kidding don't know how much more of his punches i can take is that what you're talking about yeah kind but of he's the, he's thinking it right he's not actually yes. saying it and then franklin is the next panel mommy daddy what are they doing uncle johnny uncle ben don't worry don't worry, kid. He ain't got us yet. Oh, I can barely lift my arm. That big Yahoo knocked the wind out of me. So he's kind of trying to he's kind of say trying to save face and look tough in front of Franklin, right? That's what you're talking about. Right. Right. Okay. You know, it was always funny. Um, one reviewer online pointed out how in the X Men comics, there's a lot of examples where Nightcrawler will be like being choked or being attacked or something, and he'll and there'll, there'll be a little thought bubble that says can't concentrate hard enough to teleport and it's like but you can concentrate hard enough to think about it <laughs> to think about not being able to teleport you know <laughs> yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. so that's kind of an example here that's funny yeah <laughs> well, i'd like to read that part. Yeah, okay <laughs> so overall Good okay crawler. so this was kind of to be honest of all the quasar chronology um comics we've reviewed this one has the least to do with our main theme which is reviewing um uh, quasar appearances, but it does tie into our the theme of um, all of our podcasts, which is Bronze Age, which is 70s and 80s comics. So while in the past I've been tempted to say that I want to read every single Fantastic Four comic from 61 to 90, I'm a little bit more hesitant now that I've read this. Are you more likely or less likely to want to read a 70s Fantastic Four after reading this comic? Um... Because I have so many comic books to read still, mm -hmm. I would say no. Okay. Not for now, until I've read every other comic book that I have to read on my list. Good point. Including The Punisher that you have here, so um, so eloquently collected here. Mm -hmm. um, so no, not for now. Um, and this is really... <laughs> it says a lot about why the movies are bad, too. <laughs> <gasps> what... what Explain yourself. You, okay, no, I think the movies are bad too, but what about this contributes to the movies being bad? Uh, it still goes back to, honestly, the dialogue and okay. just, um, just uh, yeah, the dialogue and just the cheapness of how that ties the scenes together, I would okay. say. Yeah. Okay, so trying to make... So in the movies, if they're going to portray the characters, they should probably not make them so close to the comics that they're they use the same type of dialogue you're saying is that part of it and, and it's weird i don't think that's really it it's hard to it's hard to figure it out to be honest okay <laughs> i don't know i don't know okay so do you think there's something that could just be inherently flawed about the fantastic four concept is it too dated now you think i think it's just cursed 
It's cursed. Okay. Yeah. Fair All point. this mysticism from this comic cursed the rest of the Fantastic Four future. That's All right. Why. The whole, okay, the whole <laughs> franchise. Gotcha. Okay, so I can say I will certainly read more Bronze Age Fantastic Four, but I would definitely like you, I would not rush out to read this. Mm-hmm. I would yes. not, you know, cancel plans to read this. But if it was in front of me and if I had nothing else to do, I would read it and enjoy it. Yes. So that's it. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much, Mara, for joining us. Mm -hmm. This has been Quasar Quinology number six. Next week, we will be reviewing Marvel 2-in-1 number 67 with our pal Marshall and his two kids, Luna and Monty. And that's going to be a really special one. So definitely join us again next week, and we'll see you then. Bye. Bye.